testing is the microphone so uh, we are online and we're in person let me know when you're un unmuting me I confirmed that we already have audio we have audio yeah. okay good morning and welcome to coffee with the birds good morning and welcome to coffee with the birds. <laughs> there is about a 30 second to one minute delay between what they what is going on in here and what they see so I'm gonna try to keep ahead of that as best as I can so their questions may lag behind a little bit and we're gonna try to be more conscientious of that this time so that we can include them better in what we're doing but we do have an online presence this morning and an in-person presence this morning we've got a full room here in the Nature Center at the Wildlife Den at Hemlock Crossing County Park and uh, glad that you're all here my name is Curtis Dykstra Parks Naturalist with Ottawa County Parks and uh, this is Coffee with the Birds um, this is the second of the season, but um, we've had plenty of seasons. We've been doing this since, since 2013, so 10 years. Um, and it has grown over the last few years immensely, and we are so glad to see a room full of people here for Coffee with the Birds this morning. Coffee with the Birds is um, an informal time for us to enjoy birds, coffee, donuts, and most importantly, fellowship. Um, fellowship with other bird nerds, right? <laughs> Whatever, wherever you are on that spectrum, of if you like birds in your backyard, the cardinals, and you can recognize a few, and you just enjoy that, you're welcome here. If you travel the world and have a life list of thousands and thousands of bird species and, and, and such, you are welcome here. If you fall somewhere in between, guess what? You're welcome here. Um, we're informal about this. We're going to watch the birds at the feeder and identify them if there's questions about them or how we're feeding them or how you could feed them. Um, if there's questions about bird sightings you've had or stories that you want to share, anything bird related, if there's some bird news that you heard recently that you want to talk about, um, I'm here to help answer those questions, but guess what? There's a lot of other knowledge in this room too, and I like to have the conversation, and we also like to include the online presence in those conversations as well. Um, but before we get started with that, I like to acknowledge, and I don't have my, my uh, picture in front of me, but maybe if you could throw the uh, um, uh, intro slide with all of the sponsors on it online. Um, I wanna thank our sponsors today for coffee for their sponsorship of, of coffee with the birds um, we have uh, simpatico coffee is what you're drinking they've donated the coffee to us um, DeBoer bakery um, has uh, in the past provided the donuts however this time I was off my a game because Mindy's out of town she's she's the heartbeat of the nature center over here and so I ordered too late and uh, so I apologize but they're from 
family fair. <laughs> if you didn't notice the difference, then kudos to family fair. Okay, so my apologies on that. Mindy is probably back in town. She'll be back in the office on Monday. Thank you. Mindy, we've missed you. I don't know if she's viewing, but she'll maybe watch it later. Um, so there's just so many little facets of this program that have to get taken care of. And when you get used to some people doing some things, and then they get they get lost. <laughs> so the donut thing was a, oh my goodness, we need to get donuts <laughs> yesterday. So we got donuts, though. We got coffee. Um, and uh, a Washington Islands Audubon Society helped to uh, provide money to help buy feed at the feeders. Um, the Brine Seed Company in Zealand has provided prizes um, for uh, the contests, um, the, the bird feeders and things that, during the giveaways. Um, they've got a huge support too, pub publicity-wise. Um, who here listens to WHCT in Holland, the radio station, and heard last week's broadcast? Anybody? Oh! No. <laughs> I happen to be the guest on the garden oh. show. Oh. Oh. Sorry, Chris, why did you send out an email? <laughs> I haven't sent my monthly email out yet. So I was going to send the link. It's online. If you go to WHDC's website and you look up the Jan Musen garden show, you can look up last week's uh, episode. And I sit for an hour and talk with Jan. And I had a wonderful time. So thank you for to WHDC, and including me in the show. She works also at DeBrine Seed Company, so it was a real easy connection to make, and and uh, loved, loved doing that. Um, so now you, you can go home and you can listen to me on the radio if you want. It's every You'll Saturday at a... You'll be viral by morning. You'll be viral by morning. <laughs> <laughs> Inundate their website. <laughs> um, 11 o'clock is when they... Um, so you could... As you're driving away from here, if you're done with the present, we're done with the presentation. Eleven o'clock is when she's got her show on WHTC. Um, and so, what's the number? What is the number on that? Somebody. Fourteen fifty a.m. Fourteen fifty a.m. They have an FM okay. number too. Fourteen fifty a.m. And what's the? Anybody know the FM dial? There's an FM too, I believe. Fourteen fifty a.m. There. Um, but you can, uh, like I said, they have it archived on the website too, so you can listen to it later. Um, so thankful to, to Brian Seed. Um, who am I forgetting, Riley? Do you have it on the screen in front of you? <laughs> no, okay. I'm going to put the pressure on Riley here. Washington Islands. Oh, I said, well, Washington Islands, yep. Yeah. Covered. No, you're good. I can say it twice. Washington Islands <laughs> provided money to uh, buy the seed, but last but not least. TSC? Uh, not this year, no. Uh, we are getting our seed now uh, with DeBrine. So, um, last but not least, Mug Club members. If you are a Mug Club member, raise your mugs. Thank you so much for your support, your purchase of these mugs, and your membership. It's not just a mug, it's a membership. And you are taking part in sponsoring Coffee with the Birds, the program. You're taking part in feeding the birds the feeder. And your support is tremendous. It is what helps us to grow this program and do what we're doing. And grow this program means we can be online and do all kinds of things like that. So thank you so much for your support. Um, if you have not picked up your mug and your mug club membership, you can do that at the front desk or you can do it online and come back and pick up your mug. Um, and this year's photo contest winner is a, it's a great one. Cedar Waxwing by Mike Virgin. Um, beautiful, beautiful picture. Enough rambling. We're here for birds, right? Yeah. I think we ought to. Uh, American Tree Scare author in front of my tree to the right and back of the tent. Under seven. Yep, there's underneath number seven in the pile right down here is American Tree Sparrow. And I'm going to move my camera down to the American Tree Sparrow. Little brown bird with a little reddish cap, a bicolored bill. The bill is yellow on the bottom and dark gray on the top. And if you if you look on the uh, board over here, it it says well what category are they in as far as migratory? Winter resident bird. This bird is not here year round. It is here just in the winter. Um, where are they in the summer? Up in the Arctic 
taiga before us, um, where the trees start to get scraggly and run out. That's where they are. I've seen them breeding in Alaska, way up by Fairbanks. Um, so um, we get them in the wintertime. They go up to Canada for the summer. Um, when we lost them on the camera here. Um, American tree sparrow. They've, they've got a plain gray breast with a, with a dot here, and they've got a bicolored bill with a reddish cap. Some people will get them confused with uh, chipping sparrows, um, but chipping sparrows leave in the winter. These guys arrive. There can be a little bit of an overlap, but uh, usually it's not for very long. American tree sparrow. Very good. We've got goldfinches up on number four. That tends to be their favorite spot if you watched the show, uh, the, the event before. Got them in the camera here. Um, so, whoop. Sorry about that online, folks. <laughs> I just pumped your camera. In, in the hustle and bustle, I even forgot to grab my binoculars. I'm all right. My eyes haven't failed me too much. And they're, they're pretty close up here. Um, Tough to Titmouse on one. We've got this camera right here dedicated to number one over here because that one, um, it tends to be the drive through restaurant. <laughs> so if you want to catch anything on number one, you got to see, watch the chickadees yeah. there. Yeah. You'll grab a nut and go. Yeah. Okay? Yeah. Drive through restaurant. Titmice, chickadees, the nut hatches will go to it. Um, whereas number four is the dine in restaurant. There's the nut hatch, white breasted nut hatch on number one. Yeah. Come in and go. So different birds feed in different ways. Tufted yeah. titmouse. So now you got all three cast yeah. characters that I mentioned, right? All right. I love it when that happens. Can um can those of you online hear me okay? Is the audio okay? Please do let us know and let me know, Riley, if when you get responses in the comments. And we got a chipmunk out. That means things are too warm. <laughs> uh, oh, yeah, they like to sleep a lot more in the wintertime than the other squirrels. Um, but when it gets warm, then they come out. Even the gray squirrels here, when it's really cold, um, they'll disappear for days at a time. How about the skunks? Um, yeah. I saw one last it. night. Did you oh. saw one? That's probably because we're having warm weather. They, they do a lot like, uh, you can hear it all right? Oh, good. Kelly's giving the thumbs up. It's live streaming in the other room, too. So, 40 people in there. 40 people? It's a place to be. Wow. <laughs> so, our head count in here is about 30, I think. 30 and 40. That's 70 people. I think that's a record for our first session. That's going to be a record for our first session. Florida right now. <laughs> what is our online audience at there, uh, Riley? 33. Wow. We're a hundred people right now. <laughs> <laughs> and I know Rick is out there watching us. Hi, Rick. He texted me just before confirming that he saw me on the, on the uh, setup. He's been instrumental, even though behind the scenes now, in us working the kinks out of what we're doing now and trying to do on our own. Um, and so we're glad to be able to have, oh, Harry Woodpecker on number four. I already had him in the camera. We've got a Downy Woodpecker here on number five. Number five is the Downy Woodpecker. Number four is the Harry. Take a look at the difference in size, okay? So those of you online, I'm going to see if I can get both of them in here. Downy and Harry Woodpecker. See, here's the Downy. Downy woodpecker, and then we're going to zoom it out and include the hairy woodpecker in the background there. How's that? All right. Two inches larger on the hairy woodpecker than the downy woodpecker. Um, there's a few other little differences between the two. Their call is different um, slightly, uh, but there's also some markings that are different. The, the uh, downy woodpecker does not have a little shoulder strap here. Um, and the hairy woodpecker does. You'll see a little black shoulder strap coming down. You also see pure white outer tail feathers on the hairy woodpecker, and you'll see dotted um, uh, white outer tail feathers on the downy woodpecker. Um, both of them, otherwise, pretty much identical in plumage. Um, 
and I've got to make sure I'm facing this way too, so that we get online. Um, both of them have pretty much otherwise uh, identical plumage, size difference, call difference, and those couple of little differences there are how you tell them apart. Um, nice when you can see them both together because I've had plenty of times where you don't get a size context, right? And it's hard to identify. So yeah, nice to get them. The, the hairy is now up on the tree well, climbing. Two, two hairy woodpeckers yeah. climbing up the tree. I'll see if I can. Nope, oh, he's going to fly off. There, I got him even on the tree in the video here. And the red belly. Oh, we got to get the red belly now. Oh, that's that's already on the other camera, isn't it? <laughs> that's on this one. <laughs> I forget what's on the other camera. <laughs> so you had two red bellies there. Counted on your eBird checklist, two red bellies. So <laughs> they had two on the, on the in the screen at one time. So they've got multiple cameras in squares on the screen that they can see. Um, and we just had it on the same feeder. There's a morning dove back behind number eight in the brush pile. I just saw it flutter. Kind of hiding out in the sticks back there. There, I can, I can just see it through the sticks with the camera here. Oh, there's another one moving back there. So what uh, questions or stories or um, anything that you want to share? Bird sightings. Yeah. Yeah, we, we've always had uh, Cooper's hawks in our backyard <laughs> chasing the birds away from our squirrel feeders. <laughs> but the uh, last week or two, we've had a really ginormous red-tailed hawk. And, and uh, I mean, when it first went by, I thought it was a Maybe a juvenile eagle that was so big, but then you can see the tail is like bright red. Mm -hmm. I guess my question is, does the, would a, the presence of a red-tailed hawk scare away the Cooper's hawks? Does, uh, or they, would they overlap territories? I don't know. We've always had a red-tailed hawk like at the other end of the street, but never at our end before. But, uh, would, would they be incompatible okay. with the two hawks? The question is, would uh, the presence of a red-tailed hawk scare away a uh, Cooper's hawk at a bird feeder setting? Um, I would say it's very likely. They're larger. I don't think that they would be under threat of actually being eaten by them, um, but I think there's an intimidation factor. Um, ter territory. But the territories typically are a little different. So red-tailed hawk is more of an open country whereas the Cooper's hawk is more forested. However, red-tailed hawks will venture into the forest, especially for breeding and things, and sometimes they show up at feeders. We've had red-tailed hawk perched right up here at our feeders, and I don't think they were there for the birds. I actually think they were there for the rodents. Our neighborhood is very open, golf, golf course, there you go. farm yep. field, so, farm field. So. so yeah, if you're on the edge, you might get both, and it'd be interesting to see um, if you stop seeing the Cooper's hawk, I think it's fair to say that there's there's an impact there. Yeah, yeah. Let me know um, if you have any questions online. Chat them in to us, and uh, I will get to them. Riley will alert me to them. Um, also, um, who is saying hello to us online, Riley? Um, we have Chris Sprick. Chris Sprick. Um, Barb. Barb is there. Eric Bowder, Lonnie Garris, Lonnie Garris, Carl and Judy, Carl and Judy, welcome. Love the love the connections here to the people online. Some familiar names and some some not. I love the, the big audience, but we've got quite an audience online. We asked them to check in. You know, where are you where are you viewing from? Um, let us know where you're viewing from. We, we'd love to see. Is there anybody out of state? Is there anybody out of county? You know, who, who who's viewing? Um, we've got over 30 viewers. That's that's always interesting to find out who's who's our audience. Any other? Yeah. What's the best way to feed juncos? Uh, the question is, what's the best way to feed juncos? Juncos like. Uh, Different birds feed different ways, they have different preferences. So if you want to attract juncos, you're going to want to have some food out of your feeders and on the ground. Um, and Do they, they feed corn or? Uh, they'll eat uh, the millet. 
Um, mm -hmm. and the cra and the cracks are in the and the sunflower seed okay. um, on the ground. Um, they'll probably eat some of the other little seeds. I don't know how much they eat the corn. They might eat some of that. The corn is good for the squirrels yeah, and some right. of the bigger birds. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the the red-bellied woodpeckers will actually eat some of the corn sometimes. Oh. Um, but the juncos, I don't know that they'll take to that so much. But the millet is probably one of your best seeds for for juncos on the ground. Okay. But put it where they want it. And the American tree sparrow, it's the same thing. Um, they like to eat on the ground. Give it to them on the ground. It's a little bit messy on the ground out here today because it's been so muddy. I was walking around and this, it was just squishing. And I was like just trying to figure out places. It was squishiest where those squirrels are sitting. And I don't know why they're digging in the mud when I've got food, <laughs> dry food, and I'm some of the better spots. But you know what? They each their own. They got an old acorn. Yeah, so the squirrels I'm talking about to those of you online are these squirrels right here in the mud. <laughs> kind of odd, but you know, I'm not going to tell them what to do. <laughs> so, oh, I think we got a hawk. That's what I'm thinking. Everything, there's nothing at the feeders right now. There was a hawk that flew through the through the high trees, or I won't be able to get a camera on it right now. But he's been spotted. Do we actually have the audio in here on? I don't think we, can you turn that on? And can you turn that dial up there, Cindy, for me, please? Oh, here, I, I got a key. I do. <laughs> Get it back. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. But the hawk went somewhere up there. I'm going to aim the camera up there somewhere. And maybe if I just kind of hold it on there for a bit, we'll see it fly, if it hasn't already. Sorry about the audio, lacking the audio. Is it on now? It, it automatically locks. So, you, it's... Oh, oh, you haven't gotten in. <laughs> I thought you'd gotten in and out. <laughs> it's all right, we're informal here, so... Um, if I haven't introduced Riley, that's Riley Dorman. Um, she is our tech person, our communications mm -hmm. person. She has been doing a lot of work with Coffee with the Birds, but also multiple other projects and doing social media. Um, she's helping with the uh, with the newsletter. She's helping with our Parks for All <laughs> initiative, which is to get every fourth grader into an Ottawa County Park for a program. Um, and doing some of the media behind that. So she's been really great, really instrumental. I love working with Riley. She's a fresh product out of GVSU, and she has a natural resources background, but she's a tech nerd, and that's all right, right? I can call you that. You can call me a bird nerd. Yeah. Which you are. Yes, Lynn. We are really lucky. Okay, so the question is, Lynn Rutan is, is asking about barred owls. She has barred owls that live near her house in the back, and uh, she hears them calling once in a while, but they've been calling a lot more lately, and the question is, are we moving into their breeding season? Um, yes, but I would actually tend to think that it's typically later in the winter than what this is, and I would have a... I would have a feeling that their calling like that is probably partially due to the fact that the weather is mimicking late February and March, and they may be a little confused, and that might be just like getting them going, Like, but then when that inevitable February storm comes, they're going to be going, whoa, wait a minute, I don't want to get, so that's my guess. Um, but February into March tends to be when their nesting starts. Um, so they might be a little bit early, but uh, probably weather related. So um, I stepped out of the nature center the other night and heard the great horned owls calling to each other. That was just not last a couple nights ago. Um, and it wasn't even dark yet, not even fully dark yet. And uh, they were, uh, they were uh, uh, duetting back and forth. Very, very pretty. So, 
And typically they get quiet this time of the year because they're on the nest by the end of January. So maybe they're just on the edge of laying eggs or something, but usually their calling diminishes right now um, and they'll be on the nest if they're not already. With the weather the way it is, they've probably been on the nest for a couple weeks, you know. <laughs> So the, the question is about snowy owls, um, and I just wanted to check. The birds haven't come back. Let me know if the birds start coming back, and I'll turn around again. But we'll kind of kind of were. And let me know if questions are coming in there too. So and okay. I'll get to that. Um, actually, to be fair, I'll get to yours in a second. How about I do this one? We'll do an online question. <laughs> Sorry. Um, but I want to answer that. Uh, the snow, it was your snowy owl question. Sorry. Um, hawk, more hawks than usual this year. Um, I wouldn't say that I've had that experience myself. I don't know if others of you, if you want to comment online or or in, in audience here, if you've had more hawks uh, around this year. Um, I'm imagining that if there is any difference in the numbers of hawks, it might have to do with the, the ground cover being uncovered and easier for them to hunt. So we might have more red tails sticking around than what normally do. Um, that's my guess. But I haven't noticed it personally, but that doesn't mean it's not uh, something that's actually happening. So. Oh, there we go. We got a hawk flying through the woods there. That's a cooper's hawk. You might have caught it on the very tail end there online, but he was flying from right to left. It looked like a cooper's hawk to me. Nice long tail, and in fact, I saw the white on the tip of the tail. Short, stubby wings with a long tail. That tail is a rudder to help them steer through the trees. A white tip on the end, and it's like a blue jay's tail. It's curved. It's it's rounded and white. We got a juvenile hanging out. And they're they're smaller than a red tail, slimmer and trimmer too, um, but uh, they're quick and they live in the woods generally. You can see them out in the open too, but generally they live in the woods and they ambush birds and eat birds. That's their that's their thing. So with him gone, maybe these birds will. I did see a few coming back in, but. Uh, um, so, yeah, the hawk thing, um, nice on cue, we got a hawk coming through. Um, I would say that if there's more hawks around, it's probably related to the weather. It probably, they don't want to go any further south than what they have to, um, because it gives them an advantage of getting further north quicker in the spring. So, so same with eagles, waterfowl will do the same thing, you know, they'll only go as far as they have to, um, a lot of times. So. I'm going to make sure that this camera is on some birds now, that that hawk is gone. Yeah, there's a goldfinch on number four there. And we got the titmouse coming into one, a couple of titmice. There have been a lot of titmice. I had probably about five of them at one time the other day. We had some fourth graders in here, and the titmouse train was just going on at number one. It was so much fun to watch. And, um, it was fun to watch the kids. Uh, Describe it as, it looks like a cardinal, but it's, you know, gray or right now. <laughs> hey, exactly. Yeah. Give it a little brain how they're go. processing things. Yeah. Yes, shape, shape, but not size or color of um, cardinal. It has a little crest on the head, a little black bee eyes. Um, so it's pretty neat. How about the snowy owls? The yeah. snowy owls. I'm not going <laughs> to the question. So I, I usually answer these questions with some caution because I want to make sure that we do any snowy owl viewing ethically. And if you have any questions about what is ethical snowy owl watching, I've got a video on that. Um, if you go onto our website, the birding website, miottawa.org slash birding, and you scroll down to the video playlists, um, you'll see one of the, um, you'll, I think it's one of the header videos there. Um, it takes you to several playlists of different uh, categories of, of uh, videos. And I do have a video about how to view them. And it's basically meaning putting the owl above your own desires to see it or photograph it up close. Okay? We've got to remember to do that because um, 
Otherwise, we threaten them and we uh, can actually cause them harm. If we're disturbing them during the day when they're trying to rest, that's energy used that could be going toward them hunting. So absolutely no flushing of owls or, or pushing the limit of, well, he's not moving yet. He's not moving yet. So we get closer and closer. Just keep your broad distance um, so that you know you're not having an impact on them. But with that said, um, and you all in Scout Town or whatever that uh, you have <laughs> followed good protocol, um, there had not been any snowy owl sightings until, was it last weekend? Yeah. Last weekend. Um, that means uh, Muskegon wastewater included, which is one of the best places in the Lower Peninsula to see them. Um, there were none in Ottawa County all fall until last weekend, which, which for us is really unusual. We usually get them on the piers along the lake um, in migration sometime after Thanksgiving till Christmas, and then they settle in somewhere, and it's usually in the farmlands to the southeast of here, um, and nothing, nothing, nothing. There were some in the UP, some over in the Thumb, um, but not here. And then suddenly, there was a report up at uh, Muskegon Wastewater. I thought, hmm, I wonder what's, what's happening with that. And then all of a sudden, there was a report for here in Ottawa County. And the one, there were actually two, and it uh, was down by the, uh, by Friesland, um, by the Zealand Airport. Um, so one, uh, one or two, I saw one. Okay. Yep, there was apparently a male and a female hanging around there um, by the Zealand Airport. Um, so, yes, um, but again, if you go, limit your, your time and respect the owl and know that you are not the only one going to see this singular bird. Um, and so respect it. Um, How far is it? I was on the street to the west of the airport. There's a, a new development of houses and things there looking across and he was sitting up on top of uh, one of the airport buildings. Well, I mean, what distance should we keep? Um, 100 yards, 100 yards is probably a good okay. guess. Yeah. Don't don't drive up right underneath the pole that he's sitting on. Um, sometimes they'll be sitting on poles as cars go right underneath them and you think, oh, well, that's fine. They don't recognize the car as a person, so it's not as threatening to them. So just, yeah. <laughs> um, don't get out and walk and make them flush because they'll see you and then they'll, 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 then they'll flush. I want them to fly only when they think they need to fly. Um, yeah. When you're talking about Zealand Airport, is that the Ottawa Airport? The Ottawa, it's not the Holland one. It's not the, the one the south side of Holland. No. This is on um, Byron Road uh, by 64th. Yeah. Yeah, Fire and Road by 64th. 56. 56 oh, is the other side of it. It was in the field in the northwest corner of 56 of Fire yep. and Road, and I viewed it from Fire and yep. Road. Yep. Yep. But it was out there. And, and I would recommend, if you want to look for them, if they're not right there, you, you do the farm roads down to the south of that and further west toward Upper Makatawa oh, okay. Natural Area. Um, they have been seen along up to 100, no, not 100, um, What's the name of the road? Perry Road. Perry Road is another oh, good yeah. road to check, yeah. which is just south of there. Um, a lot of farmlands out there. So, but yes, enjoy them, but respect them. Do we do we have anything online, Riley, that we want to tend to? Apparently, a Cooper's Hawk bus, Judy Stevens, head at the meters this morning. Oh. <laughs> so she had a similar experience up here. I assume this is uh, Judy Manning. Yeah. Judy Manning, um, one of the co-authors of this book, if you don't have any to get, um, was buzzed by a Cooper's hawk this morning while she fed the birds at her feeder. <laughs> she didn't lose any hair over it, did you? <laughs> Which, um, I'll put a little plug in for this. If you don't have this book, it's a really great book. It's not a bird identification book. It's a bird information resource. Um, about birds of Ottawa County, Michigan, specifically here. Really valuable information on each species that's ever been seen in Ottawa County. The last update was 2020. Um, uh, but uh, in the back is a really valuable tool, and that is these bar charts. Okay, so you can see where, what time of the year to look for certain species and how rare they are in each species. You can pick this up for $15 at the uh, 
Nature Center here. Um, and uh, Chip Frankie, the former naturalist here, along with Carl and Judy Manning, um, compiled this and put this together back in 2015, but then they updated it in 2020, so there's an online uh, update that you can get online. On, go to the miottawa.org slash birding, and you'll uh, be able to find the update, too. So, but uh, um, Cooper's hawks are a part of a family called Accipiters, um, and uh, the like red-tailed hawk and red-shouldered hawk, they're beautios. Accipiters are those forest-dwelling, ch uh, bird-chasing uh, hawks. Uh, sharp shin, Cooper's hawk, and anybody want to name the third one that's in Michigan? Anybody know? Uh, Peregrine? Nope, Peregrine is a falcon. Northern goshawk. Northern goshawk. And that guy is more the size of a red-tailed hawk. Very big and buff, and, um, but they are an accipiter, and they are well known for actually attacking humans that are close to the nest. And they will actually make physical contact, and you do not want physical contact with that bird. So, but yeah, if you ever know where a goshawk nest is, let me know. But wear a hard hat when you go. Um, they're a northern forest dweller, um, and hard to find in Michigan, but they're there. A really large tracts of forest. Um, and they can come down this far south in the winter, but we don't see very many of them here at all. Yeah? Um, as far as the snowy owls, does the snow cover affect how many of those there are around? In other words, if there's a lot of snow cover, do they come warm because of the camouflage? Okay. So the question is, will there be more snowy owls if there's more snow cover? Because uh, it helps camouflage them. I actually would say no. Um, if you think about it, where they nest in the summertime, there's actually the snow is melted and they nest on the bare ground and they're stark white. So their stark whiteness um, maybe is better for just hunting. Um, you know, they will they will actually hunt the ice flows out on the uh, on the uh, sea there and on the Great Lakes. It's one of the reasons why they come into the Great Lakes. They'll hunt the, the ice flows there for waterfowl and things like that. Um, but I think it has more to do with population than it does actually the weather. Um, that's that's my gut on it. When there's a population boom in the north, that means more of them are actually going to come down. We actually had it flipped on its head before. We thought it was when they were starving they came down. And that may be true to a degree, but it's actually when they're starving, um, there's not as many of them around, so then there's not as many to spill in. But when they have a banner year up in the Arctic, with lots of lemmings to eat, they have lots of young, and they all survive, and they all need a place to go. And that's what the research has been showing. Is, uh, it, their being here is related to the population. Yeah. Anything online? Yes. Yeah. What is your opinion slash experience with hand feeding birds? With hand feeding birds? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> You're getting into. Uh, some dangerous territory. There are people that will take both sides of the issue with hand feeding birds. So the question online is, do I have any opinions on hand feeding birds? Is, is, is there anybody that hand feeds birds here? Just a country. Yeah, there are certain places where you know you can hand feed. Um, I think, this is personal opinion, but I think as long as you're still keeping the birds' needs first, um, it's 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 a great way to make a connection with people to the natural world. One of my fondest memories was going to Howard Christensen Nature Center back in the day when I was probably eight years old and hand feeding a chicken. And that has a lasting impact. So, but what we need to do is balance that with, with um, the birds' needs. So I don't think that our feeder birds are going to be that it's going to be detrimental to them. They still seem weary. They come in, they grab, they go. If I were to lunge at them, they wouldn't just stay there. You know, they're not going to sit on my finger. Um, I think it's different for habituating birds like owls to us with, with rodents because then they'll come to us and then they are more in danger of, of coming in contact with cars or things like that. It's different with the small birds here. That's, that's my experience and my opinion. I have hand fed uh, birds. Uh, last year when I was in the UP there were some really friendly, I was up there and staying at an Airbnb and uh, the guy said I could put out a feeder so I did 
and the birds were coming in like gangbusters, and, and I said, I'm going to just go out there and see. And sure enough, just came right in and, and out of my hand. And it's, it's an amazing feeling. It really is. Um, and, and so I don't necessarily have a problem with it, so long as you're conscientious um, of the bird disease. There's a red pole over on the ground under eight by the junco, so he ducked his head, I see red. Hold on, we got a bird oh, on the ground. Yeah, it could be that. Oh, uh, yeah, we got a, 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 a tree sparrow again. Okay. Yep, the tree sparrow is on the ground with juncos. Yeah. Put those on the camera here. That can be confused with a red pole because it does have that red. That, yep. Yep. So there's a bunch of juncos and uh, an American tree sparrow underneath number eight. There's a hairy woodpecker now on number five. Do you hear the sharp peak? Yeah. No? Yeah. Peak. Well, he's on branch behind number seven. And the branch behind number seven? Yeah. Oh, to the left. Oh, flying up and now flying down. There's a nuthatch there and another hairy woodpecker up there. Two downy woodpeckers right up here. What is that sparrow behind? Oh yeah, right behind, behind the tree, oh. Curtis. Oh, well. Maybe I can't Maybe see it. Oh, up, uh, yeah, it looks right. like a tree sparrow. Oh. Yep, that just hopped. Oh. Yeah. Yep, tree yeah. sparrow on the branch. perched up there. Mm -hmm. Yep. The yep, I don't think I can get him on this camera unless I scooch it. Oh, I'm gonna get this nut hatch here. If he's gonna stay, and of course he doesn't. <laughs> but there is a hairy woodpecker real close up. Let's get a nice close up of the uh, hairy woodpecker here. And this hairy woodpecker is trying to uh, adjust to my adjustment on the feeder, the wood. I put a little piece of cardboard on the back side of that today. So now he has to stick his head up. Now we can see it. We'll see how long it lasts. Here he goes. Downy and Harry Woodpecker you together. Because <laughs> otherwise they like to hide on the back side. And it just, Ooh, it, there he goes. Wow. Yeah. He's swallowed. Yeah, look at him. He's picking out. Oh, man. There's a Downy Woodpecker on there, too. There's two Harrys and two Downies yeah. at the same time here. That is raw suet there from the from the butcher. Um, I highly recommend it during the winter time when it's cold um, to to uh, do suet. Um, there you go, even better than the last time. Downy and Harry Woodpecker together. Um, nut hatch on the tree over here behind six and seven. We got goldfinches starting to descend out of the trees like they're gonna go down to number four. I track my time here. Oh, we got time. Good. Good. Time goes pretty quickly. What's the easiest way to tell the difference between the Coopers and the Sharp? Coopers and Sharp Shin Hawk? They're so. Yeah, so the, the question is the difference between a Coopers and a Sharp Shin Hawk. Um, size is one thing, Sharp Shin Hawk is smaller. However, the male Sharp Shin Hawk, there's the order of size male Sharp Shin Hawk, female Sharp Shin Hawk, male Coopers Hawk. And these two can be pretty close in size. Female Cooper's hawk is the largest. Okay? Um, so size, if you see one that's about the size of a blue jay or just a little bigger, um, that's, that's, a, that's a sharp shinned hawk. They're small. Okay? They're not much bigger than a blue jay. All right. We have a juvenile. Juvenile Cooper's, yeah. So the, uh, there's some other identification features as, as far as their tail is squared on a, on a sharp shin hawk and it's rounded on a Cooper's. Um, the cap is darker on a, on a Cooper's hawk and looks more brushed back on a Cooper's. Yep. And then the, um, and the, the sharp shin hawk has a really rounded, almost dove-like head. And, and the color on the head is not really any darker than what's on the back. Whereas on the Cooper's hawk, it's going to be darker on the head this than that. Good. Yeah. And then when you get the juveniles involved, it's a little different. They're the brown ones with streaks on the front. Yeah. Yep. We got more birds over here now. The finches. There we go. What do we got going online, everybody? Are you seeing birds at your feeder? If so, what ones? What kind of coffee are you drinking? What What's going on out there in the virtual world? <laughs> we'll get about a minute before we start getting responses, huh? Um, it's 
Hmm. A question online is, is the leucistic goldfinch still around? I've not seen it in several days. However, it was maybe a week ago that I saw it, so it may still be around. It shows up periodically. We'll definitely zoom in on it if we find it. Now, we've been having a leucistic goldfinch showing up at the feeders here. By leucistic, that means it's, it's, it doesn't have all of its uh, melanin. And so it's very white. But it's got some yellow in the face, so it's not truly albino. Albino would be all white with no melanin, melanin in it and, and uh, pink eyes. So this is leucistic is kind of a form of that, but it's very leucistic. It's, got, it's almost entirely white except for the kind of yellow wash on your face. And you'll see the shadows of the black and white markings on the wing. Has he been back since the last class? Yes, yes, yeah. He's been, yeah. He's been back. I think I saw him maybe a week ago. So here's a chickadee coming in. And a lot of people don't realize that they eat suet too. He's on the suet feeder now. They'll eat, the, the small birds will eat suet too. <laughs> They're trying to figure that out, aren't they? They don't, they don't like the, uh, the cardboard back there. Any other questions or comments or responses online? How many how many species do the Mannings have at their feeders this morning compared to us? <laughs> yes. Um, uh, last fall, coming back from Cranville, uh, we we saw in a cornfield a flock of sandhill Sandhill cranes do live in our area. They do nest in our area. Um, we have them nesting in several parks around. Their their comeback story has been quite a quite a, a great one. From back when I was a kid, um, they were extremely rare, um, and even longer ago than that, they were they were on in danger of becoming extirpated from Michigan. So their comeback story. Um, is a great one, but they are nesting in Ottawa County Parks. I've seen an increase. I've seen an increase in the number of of uh, sandhill cranes in our area over the time that I've been working here, which is 10 years now. Um, and places to look are the marshes along the Grand River. Um, really good places. So uh, Bruce's Bayou is probably one of the best spots to see them in breeding season. Um, and they'll breed in somewhat colonial fashion, like there'll be multiple breeding pairs out there, but they mostly get together in flocks for migration. So come March, when we get those sunny days, uh, things start heating up and the snow starts melting, you'll see flocks of them coming over, you'll hear them. Um, they'll, they'll fly north in flocks, but then they'll disperse and find their breeding territories. They're more numerous up in the UP, um, they're almost like a roadside bird up there, <laughs> all over the place. Um, and then in the fall, they they gather together at roosts, um, getting ready to migrate south. So there are a few of those places where they kind of gather in large numbers. And we actually did a uh, bus trip. Uh, anybody here was on the bus trip? No? We did a bus trip in October down to Bellevue. Um, there's, a, there's a baker... Uh, sanctuary down there, and they have a sandhill crane fest every year. And uh, at, in the evening, you can watch the cranes come and land in the marsh there uh, by the thousands. So, so keep that on your radar for next October. We may have to do that one again. Um, but uh, yeah, crane fest every year down in Bellevue. Question. Sandhill crane is basically all spring. Oh yeah. If you see them at all, right? Sometimes I'll hear them and not see them. And, yep. Um, because sometimes they're so high, and I'm trying to pull up their song here. Thank you. 
Sand Hill Crane. I'm going to try to get a flock of them. Isn't there a, um, What's that? Isn't there a place in Fremont that's a sanctuary? Fremont Sanctuary. I'm not sure. Is there anybody aware of this? Wilson Road? Yeah, we used to be oh. there. Wilson Road up around Louvre or Fremont. Yeah. Could be. I'm, I'm not aware of that one, though. But, uh, yeah, sometimes they're so high, you hear their sound, it carries down to the ground, but then you look up and you're trying, especially on those bright sunny days, it's really hard to see them. But, uh, oh, well, look at all the gold pitches. My goodness. So we've got lots of gold pitches. Not just at that feeder, but at this feeder, too. Lots of gold pitches. But unfortunately, we've not had any other winter finches this year. Um, Earlier in November, and you know this just from the photo contest, right? We had one of the honorable mentions was of uh, an evening grosbeak. Evening grosbeaks came in in November, but they've since dispersed. I see a, a single, singular report every now and again that somebody saw one fly over, but the flocks have moved on somewhere else. Um, but other than that, I really haven't seen much of a finch invasion. So no red poles. There were red poles on the... Um, Christmas bird count. Somebody saw red poles on the Christmas bird count, but I've not seen any more reports. Um, no pine siskins either. So it's kind of a poor finch year, other than the fact that we had those uh, evening grosbeaks. Even house finches come to like House finch. When house finches are are uh, resident, they're here year round. So, but I, I think that their population is actually hitting a bit of a low. I think they must have had some sort of a disease, which they're more vulnerable to since they're stock came from such a small number of birds, I think they are more vulnerable um, uh, as far as their immune systems. And, and they're the ones you'll typically see with the, the uh, conjunctivitis on their eyes and things. So, But uh, they are not native to Michigan. You didn't know? They are not, not native to Michigan. They came in the 80s um, as, a, as that species moved across from the East Coast. They were uh, part of the pet trade on the East Coast. I want to say if it was New York or somewhere on the East Coast, they had some in a in a illegal pet trade shop, and they were raided by the feds, and they let them go out the back door. And now you have them in your yard. So kind of an unusual story, but they are actually native to the West Coast um, and Southern California. Um, but now they have moved across the U.S. Now, if you look at the range map, I think it, it, it goes all the way across, or just about. So, yep, yeah, house finches. So curious, Anything? Oh. We, we have bluebirds. Mm -hmm. is, is, either not like, is, is that unusual? So we have like four of them. Okay. Steady. I'll answer that, and then I'm going to make sure we check in online one more time before we wrap up here. Um, bluebirds, do we have, are bluebirds unusual? Um, bluebirds are here in the wintertime, for sure, every year. And okay. I think increasingly so as our winters have become more mild. Oh, okay. um, and they will eat berries instead of insects through the winter. They'll, they'll flock up with, with other birds and they'll co-roost in a bird box to stay warm. Um, and then in the spring, then they're that much closer to the breeding territory and can disperse and start breeding earlier. So. Yeah. What's that? You're eating, eating suet? suet only. Suet only? Yep. They'll eat suet, they'll eat mealworms, and they'll eat uh, berries. So, but yeah, if you if you have them in your yard, it's you can consider yourself lucky. We've never been able to get them at the feeders here, but um, they are definitely around, especially if you have okay. good habitat, you can find them. I think they never were around. Also yeah. They were here. I think it's increasingly so that we're seeing them in the winter. Right. How about online here? Do we have anything? Anybody we've commenting? Best practices for cleaning feeders. I don't have any of the resources right offhand, but um, it's probably good to do that probably once a month where you clean the junk off of it, you wash it, soap and water, mild detergent, and, and then... Um, and then let them dry fully before you put them, put them out. Um, but it really depends, honestly, and what shape they're in is what my opinion is, because some of them, you know, the wetter they are and the more they get caked up and 
the less they're used, I think the quicker they go bad. Um, if they're flying through the seed in a day or two and you keep replacing it, I think it doesn't provide as much time for the stuff to go bad. So just look at your feeder. Your feeder will tell you if it needs to be clean. Um, but yeah, stay on top of that best you can. Yep. Any other questions online before we? They all bailed. They all bailed. Oh, there they go. And here's a nut hatch in case we. The nut hatch is frozen. There might be a hawk warning anyway. This is a, a great look at a female nut hatch. Take a look at the head, the cap. Is it solid black, like jet black? No. Do you see the little gray blue in the in the in the cap? That's a female. If you see one with jet black on the cap, that's the male. So they have a little bit of a grayish blue tinge to their head. Do they ever eat right side up? <laughs> <laughs> I think they like to show all the I mean, other birds what they can do by yeah, hanging upside down. One. Yep. Yep. <laughs> Excellent. Excellent. I am seeing that we are already at 25 after, and I do need to transition to the other room here for my presentation. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to wrap up the feeder viewing session in here. What, what you can do, Riley, if you don't mind just putting it on some feeders for a few minutes, um, people can watch that. Those of you online, um, I didn't create a video myself for the topic of the tidbit. But what I did do is provide some links on the blog page and in the comments of this video, this live stream video, that if you click on those, it'll take you to, there's three links to three different videos on how to use Merlin Bird ID app. I hope they're useful to you. If you have additional questions, you can always let me know. Um, I'd love to engage you with that. Um, I'm going to do the presentation here, and I hope you find that useful. I hope you've enjoyed Coffee with the Birds online. Um, hopefully I've gotten to all of your comments or questions. Yeah, I'm getting the thumbs up from Riley. If you have additional comments, questions, things like that, let us know. We want to know because guess what? I can't see what you're seeing right now online. So how we can improve that, let us know how we can improve it. Um, hopefully this is a, an improvement over the last time and we hope to continue adding some layers of improvement as we go on. But thank you for joining us online. You can go ahead and mute me uh, and then put it on some of the feeders where there's some birds. But thank you for joining and we'll see you next time. Uh, February 11th, February 11th, right here, same time, same place.